Are you getting the most out of the interpersonal activities that you use in your classroom? Well, in this episode, the Meredith White, a Spanish teacher in Georgia, joins me with lots of ideas for interpersonal activities that you can use right away in your classroom. So, so many of my guests on the podcast have mentioned Meredith White and the activities that she shares. I had to go right to the source. So let's jump in. Are you a language teacher looking for some reassurance that what you're doing in the classroom is on the right track? Or maybe you're looking for some ways to teach even more effectively. If you're one or the other or somewhere in between, you've landed in the right place. This is the World Language Classroom Podcast with your host, me, Joshua Cabral. You're about to get tips, tools, and resources so that your students continue to rise in proficiency and communicate with confidence. Let's jump in. Vamos, allons-y. Hello, my friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Hola, mis amigos. Welcome to the World Language Classroom Podcast. I am Joshua Cabral, and you know I have to start by saying thank you. You're a teacher listening to a podcast about teaching, so that makes you an incredible educator just for simply doing that. But you're doing so much more, of course. But thank you for taking the time out of your week to engage in this type of PD, this type of professional development. It is helpful for all of us to collaborate like this. So if you have been listening to the podcast over the last, oh, 70 plus episodes, when I ask teachers about where their inspiration comes from, I always ask that. There's a name that comes up more often than not, and that name is Meredith White. And it's sort of one of those names that sometimes it just kind of rolls off the tongue. And so, yes, oh, so of course there's Meredith White and everything that she does, and Finally, I just said, okay, everyone's talking about it. Let's just get Meredith on the podcast and hear directly from her because it's what all the cool kids are talking about right now. So I have Meredith with me here today. So thank you so much for joining me here on the podcast, Meredith. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's so embarrassing. (laughs) (laughs) But the, you know, it's that it's that humility and humble approach that makes you approachable. And so you don't have to agree with any of this. You just have to sit there and listen to it. That's it. That's that's your job. (laughs) Done. (laughs) Yes. So I have been following you on social media, particularly on Twitter and other places. I've seen a number of webinars that you've done uh, with different people from all over the country. Then particularly during the pandemic, a lot of that was happening. And then when I put on Twitter last year that I was going to work in a school to work with teachers in a school in Atlanta. And when you messaged me on Twitter and you said, I'm in the Atlanta area, let's get together for dinner. And I was like, oh my gosh, Meredith White just invited me out to dinner. So that was awesome. Thank you for doing that. Of course. Thank you for responding. I was like, oh my gosh, you're asking Joshua Cabral at the dinner. He's going to be too busy. And he's, he, come on, he's working. He's working. No. We went to the Iberian pig. I've been telling people about the Iberian pig ever since I got back. It's a winner. It's it's always a great choice in the Atlanta area. You can't go wrong. All right. Okay. Well, I think we've gushed about each other enough. I think oh. people are annoyed. We need to move on. <laughs> enough, you two. Okay, enough, you two. All we're right. Sorry. Okay. 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 So we're we're going to talk about these communicative activities and interpersonal activities today. And I've seen a number of these that you've talked about over the years that you've shown to teachers. It's going to be great to have the opportunity to hear you explain some of the the details. And not just that, I mostly appreciate, or the thing I appreciate the most, I would say, is that anything you ever share, it's something that you've done and you've honed. You're never saying, oh, here, try this. So I think you'll be able to give kind of like the, I'm going to call them the pro tips, but they're more the experience tips, right? (laughs) Right. Well, it's hard. I mean, sometimes you get, sometimes you get replies that are, you know, I'm always thankful for the way that we're able to connect with people online. But once in a while, there's something like, hey, but have you considered? And I always think, I always laugh to myself, like, Oh, it's too late. I did this this morning. Yeah, like it's <laughs> that ship has sailed. It already it already happened. And people will have amazing suggestions like, mm-hmm. "Oh, I love that question. Could you maybe tweak that wording?" And I'm like, 
yes, for sure. Next time, <laughs> because I yeah. already did it. It's too late. <laughs> yeah. Whenever I do workshops in schools, and I also recommend on this podcast that whenever you hear something that you put it in your tomorrow bucket, your next week bucket, your next unit bucket, or maybe a mindset shift bucket. Amen. You know, so some of these things will be yep for tomorrow and maybe a different unit. But it's the fact that teachers are listening and wanting to learn these things is just incredible in itself, right? Absolutely. So, can you talk to us a little bit about your own personal journey with interpersonal activities or communicative language teaching? What What's that looked like for you over the years? Sure. It looks, I think, a lot like it looks for a lot of people, which I think they and I both find relatable. So like I started teaching uh, two days after I finished undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> because I, which I recommend to zero people. Um, if it's a Yelp review, I give that experience zero stars also, <laughs> like zero out of five, zero out of 10 would return. Like mm -hmm. that is it. It was a terrible idea, but I did gain a lot from that. But I say that because I have never not been a working teacher. I have never in my adult working life not been a teacher. And when I first started out, literally those two days afterwards, I graduated on a Saturday, started on a Monday, and I finished the year for someone. So I did like nearly the last quarter because it was a district that went into June, late June. And so those next, you know, whatever, six, seven weeks were, you know, hey, we're going to do page 11 today. And guess what we're going to do tomorrow? Page 12. And then mm -hmm. the day after that, shocker, page 13. Like it was not very sexy teaching, mm -hmm. but it got the job done. And my first four years were pretty much just sort of some slightly improved copy of that. And what I found was I was filling time. I wasn't really thinking intentionally about how I was filling time. Like if I had three activities, activity one probably did not lead to two and two probably did not lead to three. And one and three probably did not have anything to do with each other. So I had good bones in that I was like enthusiastic. I was thinking about my travel experience. My language skills were excellent. My, you know, all of these other pieces kind of filled in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And for the first couple of years, it really was sort of personality over pedagogy, which is really mm -hmm. embarrassing to admit. But you're just kind of keeping everything afloat. Mm -hmm. And interpersonal was for sure the mode that suffered the most. I would like to get all of those students, like my first, I don't know, what do you have? 150 kids a year, right? <laughs> so like, I'd like to get the first, you know, like 750 students like in a gymnasium and just apologize, you know, and just be like, <laughs> I just want to let you guys know. I'm yes. really sorry. Um, Cause they were absolutely the kids that left levels one and two like things like, I don't know any Spanish, you know, how you overhear them or, you, you know, they tell their next teacher like, oh, we didn't speak it. No, they were now they'd be lying, but they were absolutely telling the truth then. And so for me, it's really been a journey of kind of survival, like surviving all of that and then seeking out really authentic tasks and really diving into like, why are we talking about what we're talking about? And then how can I, as a teacher, kind of use this essentially manufactured space? I mean, mm -hmm. we, you know, as much as we say, like, turn your classroom into a restaurant, at the end of the day, it's not, you know? It's and so, like, yeah, it's not a restaurant. <laughs> and, like, I, you know, I'll well, cook with my students. I've done that. I've done all these different things that sort of – and obviously, we're engaging with them on an authentic level. Did you guys win volleyball last night? How was the – you know, how was your vacation? Like, we're we're trying to have all these different – interpersonal conversations, but sometimes it's just going to have to be mm -hmm. partner A and partner B, you know, like mm -hmm. we just have to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's definitely been a journey of mm -hmm. that in varying degrees yeah. and really a lot of reflection and mm -hmm. kind of discovery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was that turning point for you where you started to really find ways to effectively use communicative teaching? And I don't know, maybe we'll call it just bringing communication to your classroom. That's mm. always the first step. But then to, to really understand what that interpersonal mode is. For me, I was seeing something missing from my, from my lessons. And like I said, my students would leave and be like, Hey, Miss White, you know, love you. Had a great year. Like, see you next year. But then you'd overhear them saying like, oh, no, I don't know any Spanish. <laughs> and it was like, well, wait, what? What just happened? Like, how did we just have such a seemingly positive experience and yet you don't feel you can speak any Spanish? Or you watch students freeze up in the hall, right? You see them walking mm -hmm. with their little friends and you're like, buenos dias, Joshua. Mm -hmm. You know, and you see them go like, 
<laughs> you know, and it's like not in the wild, you know, like I only do that in the classroom. Don't catch me out, you know, with my friends, lady, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was ruminating on that for a couple of years. And then summer of 2015, a tell project workshop with Thomas Sauer really opened my eyes as to how to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget, I was like showing him a rubric about like a, a quote unquote clothing unit. Mm-hmm. And I was going like, so first, you know, they talk mm-hmm. to each other and they ask each other like, okay, what are you wearing today? And he was like, who does that serve except for like people who are visually impaired? And he mm-hmm. wasn't being like cheeky and he wasn't mm-hmm. trying to be like any kind of whatever. And I was like, I don't understand. He's like, they can literally see each other probably. Like, mm-hmm. why are they asking each other <laughs> what they're wearing? <laughs> and they can just look and go, yes. I really like your sweater. You know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. that's really that's a really nice mm-hmm. color, like instead of something deeper. And mm-hmm. I remember I was like, <gasps> Oh no, because I all of my level one and two units and a lot of them were really superficially framed like that. I mean, Mm -hmm. it was just kind of basic. And in my mind, it was like in the name of language, in the name of quote unquote practice, but like, when's the big game? Like Mm -hmm. if we're practicing, when's the game? When's Uh, the like, you know what I mean? Like, what are, what are we Mm -hmm. doing? And I was just like devastated by that, but I knew he was right. And I, I love Thomas for a lot of reasons, but he has that way of delivering that feedback where he's kind of like, mm-hmm. eh? you uh-huh. know, and uh-huh. cause he knows, yeah, like he knows his stuff and he knows he's right. And he knows he just like rocked your world. And I was like, I'm going to need to sit with this for a minute, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> but, but that's been seven years, you know? Mm-hmm. So seven years on now constantly reflecting going, okay, what are, what, what next? What does mm-hmm. this interpersonal activity lead to? How did I lead up to it? Like, mm-hmm. what's the context and what are what are we doing here? Right. So what then made those activities communicative or what makes any mm-hmm. activity communicative? So what was different from the, oh, I like your sweater. What color is it? It's like, can't you see that it's green? <laughs> you know? So like that was what we thought was a communicative partner activity. But so how did you go about making tweaks to that so that it was truly communicative and interpersonal? Mm, absolutely. So I had to think about the edges. I had to think about what was leading up to it, like the bookends, what was leading up to it, and then what was the result of that? So like, what are actual things we'll talk about? What are actual questions? What is sort of the order of operations in the way we communicate with each other? Mm -hmm. And one example I always use is sort of the hashtag everyday IPA, which Mm -hmm. is like, sometimes we'll see a thing or we'll hear a thing. Then we'll talk to somebody else about a thing and then we'll talk about the thing. So we sort of go in together out a lot of times in a natural way, just in our lives. Mm -hmm. We see something on social media. We turn to our significant other and go, did you see so-and-so post it? Oh my gosh, I'm going to reply. Right there in that one interaction, it was like in together out. You know, we Mm -hmm. saw the thing, we we somehow interpreted the thing, we interpersonaled about the thing. I made that into a verb. Mm -hmm. And then we (laughs) presentationaled about the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I really started thinking about that. And then also, now, how am I the teacher? Like I said, sort of framing it on the edges. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not, what do you like to wear? Although I think that's a fine question too. But maybe it's how you express yourself with clothing. Mm -hmm. And then I am going to be prompted as a teacher to think, oh, man, like there's a lot of vocabulary that I'm going to need to anticipate, which we should be doing anyway. But when we're bogged down, we're not always thinking about like, okay, did I include all of these things? So it's going to naturally, hopefully lead you also to some inclusive and just really like all embodying language too. Mm -hmm. Because when we look at those generic units, you know, it's shirt, pants, shoes, whatever. And that's fine. But if we want to say instead, como te expresas con la ropa? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you Mm -hmm. express yourself with clothing or with fashion or with just kind of outward appearance in general? That's Mm -hmm. a little deeper. We're going to need some more. I teach high school. So we're going to need some more vocabulary. We're going to need maybe gauges or hair color or, you know, different piercing vocabulary Mm -hmm. or just different ways of altering your outward appearance or just really thinking about things like that. Like it's a deeper question to go, Mm -hmm. why do you wear what you wear or what don't you wear Mm -hmm. with some body parts? I said recently, I was like, I don't really do skirts because I really like pants. I'm kind of more of a pants person. And then somebody was like, how do you say self-conscious? And I was like, oh, amazing. And so they are able to go like, okay, self-conscious, you know, insert body part, like 
no me gusta, the clothing, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a heavy thought for right. like a level one language class to go, mm, I don't really wear, you know, short sleeve shirts because I'm self-conscious about my arms yeah. or something like that. And that's what's really coming up in either conversations with ourselves mm-hmm. or with people in our lives, not just, mm-hmm. I like your sweater or maybe where'd you get it? Where'd right. you get it? That's great. Mm-hmm. We ask that all the time. Yeah. But not just like, what are you wearing? <laughs> right. So I'm thinking of the book Common Ground. And I spoke mm. with Florencia Henshaw and Maris Hawkins. And when oh. they talked about communication in their book, they just brought it down to these two simple questions. What is being conveyed? What information is being conveyed? And then the second question is, and what are you going to do with it? Right. You know? Right. And so I think we're We're really good at what's the information being conveyed? Oh, they can tell you about clothing. Okay, great. Why are you talking about clothing? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) It's those those simple questions that we just we just have to make sure we go to number two. Right. right. Don't forget to keep going. And you know what? I think in the day to day, like for me, like I said, those first few years, like longer than I'd like to admit, but here we are, right? Um, I I I would that's, that's where you get stopped. You know, that's where like the lesson interrupts you or like, again, just everything so fast that you're like, okay, we did lesson, we did activity one, activity two. Oh shoot. I'm going to have to, all right, we'll do the next part tomorrow. And like I said, one and two and three maybe had nothing to do with each other. It was just like, okay, fly swatter. It's a classic, Mm -hmm. right? Who didn't, Mm -hmm. who didn't Mm -hmm. play fly swatter? So it's (laughs) like, we're going to do a little fly swatter game and then we're going to do a partner, a partner B, and then you're going to do, um, another game or something. And maybe they were sort of vaguely connected, but they were not intentional at Mm -hmm. all or, you know, and so it was just everything kind of worked in isolation. And that's exactly it. We never got to step two of like, okay, yeah, we have this information. So what? Right. So I really am looking forward to hearing some great interpersonal activities uh, from you, as I'm sure everybody is. Before we get there, though, this is often a question that comes up. That's a question on teachers' minds whenever we're doing these interpersonal activities. They may be in a place where they have a prescribed curriculum, Mm. and that may mean that there is particular vocabulary, which isn't so much of an issue, but sometimes there is this prescribed grammar that needs to be covered. Mm -hmm. And there's this grappling with being communicative when you also have to sometimes, unfortunately, have to follow this grammar curriculum. So are those two things mutually exclusive in your opinion or in your experience, or is there kind of a common ground, happy medium with those? I think there's absolutely a common ground. I'm in a big department. I'm in a big school in a big district, and my classes are big. So it's like everything is always on a big scale in my world. And I come back really often to John Bracey's rule number one, don't get fired, right? Like that's (laughs) rule one is don't get fired. I completely, completely relate to that because I have to do a lot of things that I think, oh, I wish I wouldn't have to do X, but I'm also really appreciative for the structures in place. And I've been places where you're just sort of on your own and it's like, okay, whatever you want to do. And that can be overwhelming too. So it's this weird sort of like three little bears kind of thing. You know what I mean? You want the porridge to be just the right temperature, too hot, too cold, like freedom, but also flexibility. So I think finding a nice spot there where you might not have a lot of freedom, but maybe you have some flexibility. Mm -hmm. And for me, when the grammar sort of is quote unquote sort of prescribed or sort of given to you, sometimes that can make it really easy to do it because at least you know what the expectation is. You know, mm-hmm. you're like, okay, well, Sarah and a star, great. Mm-hmm. You know, passe compose, no problem. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I will will do that. And it can at least give you some place to start and it can feel unnatural to go, okay, I've got to do preterite and imperfect, right? That's the verb we use too. Mm-hmm. I just did it. Like mm-hmm. I've got to do, I've got yeah. to cover, yeah. they need to learn. But here I am, you know, 22 years into Spanishing, and I still will hear someone use preterite imperfect differently. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what was that? Mm -hmm. Why Mm -hmm. would you use that? So there are these long term, late acquired structures that we just know exist, and we know they're complicated, and they tend to be what we sort of grapple with and fight about as Mm -hmm. language teachers. But I think as long as you know you've got to do them in some capacity, you can at least then try to think of as authentic as possible mm-hmm. of a scenario or a number of scenarios where you can at least have students sort of negotiate meaning within them. So mm-hmm. if you know you have to do, like I have to do in level two, 
a childhood unit. It's just the, one of those typical novice units. We all mm-hmm. have seen it. And because we do it in January, I also like to use it for previous semester. So thinking of actually, again, what are you thinking about? New Year's resolutions. Even if it's not a thing you do, you know it's a thing other people do. So it might be like, you know what? Last semester, I was pretty disorganized. This semester, I want to be, I'm going to be, I need to be. I mean, there's three structures you can Mm -hmm. use with to be, which are really great. And then those dive into, well, what is it you need to be? Because we could do a little Sarah and a star, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're still thinking about what it is you want them to do. Like you're thinking about the purpose of the conversation while I think acknowledging that there are just grammar structures in place right. and we're going to have to just highlight and explicitly go over some things so that mm-hmm. we don't get fired and also honor our colleagues. Mm-hmm. My grandma used to say it's it's a dirty bird that messes in its own nest, mm-hmm. meaning you know you make your own disaster and it's like, why are you creating chaos in your own life? Mm-hmm. You're, you need to take care of the people around you and you need to water your own garden and all that kind of thing. And so for me and my department, if I weren't collaborative, if I weren't honoring those structures in place and also all the work that my colleagues are doing, and let's be honest, knowing that my colleagues get my students. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've all seen those students that are like, hey, senor, love you, (laughs) miss you. I'm not learning anything in level three. And you're like, no, 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 (laughs) no. Like, stop yelling stuff like that out loud. Um, And Mm -hmm. if you've never had that experience, I am so I am super jealous, but so to way too many of us have. And so that can create weird things between colleagues where, you know, you're listening to students or students are going, we never learned that. And you know, they did, or mm-hmm. you were their teacher. So you right. for sure know <laughs> they did. We didn't speak any French last year. Yes, we did. Yes, we did, Johnny. We did. So mm-hmm. it's all of those kind of moving pieces can make that a very uncomfortable relationship but I absolutely think there is a happy medium or it's a, it's a bit of a teeter totter. And I think that's okay too. Okay. So now we're going to get into what I'm going to do first period tomorrow is what (laughs) I want to call it. (laughs) So some interpersonal activities that have been effective for you that you would recommend for other teachers. And I mean, I'm sure that examples you'll give were on particular themes. So I always like to think, okay, how can we look at different themes and different things like Mm -hmm. that? But, uh, Let's kind of use your examples as some springboards. So what do you have to share with us? Well, my favorite is an interpersonal roster, which I try to do every unit. And what I do is I choose like five to six guiding questions. And I got this from Sarah Loveless in Kentucky. She's an incredible teacher. And she outlined this. And then I've kind of tweaked it to where you've got your entire roster for your class. So you've got first period. If if it's just like printed out from your blank grade book or whatever, obviously no identifying information, just their name. And then across the top, let's say it's like ours that prints out as many columns as you want it to, but I usually like about five or six. And I'm going to pick five questions that kind of guide the unit. And I call them our unit guiding questions. So Mm -hmm. like if it's unit one, it's it's always where you're from, you know, how old are you? Um, where do you live? Uh, what's your birthday? Those weird mm-hmm. novice questions that are just mm-hmm. sort of like a jar of random information, like <laughs> rattling around where you're like, listen, dear best kid, you know? yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of real weird stuff about you. And it's the fourth day of school, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's real early in the relationship. So that's usually those. And what's really fun is little by little throughout the unit. So our units are about three weeks. I can say, let's say Tuesday, Thursday, right? If I know it's going to be three weeks, that's three sets of Tuesday, Thursday that I can say, all right, 10 minutes on the clock and we're going to do interpersonal roster. And they're asking all of those questions to as many classmates as possible. So if I know we're going to do it six times over the unit, let's say two times in one week, three weeks, and we've got, let's say 36 other kids in class, because I do, they're going to need to talk to five to six kids each time. And they've got to be different because our students also gravitate around towards their friends, the same people, you know, but they don't really kind of work the room. And what's nice is either in segments like that, after they get, let's say 10 classmates, if they have 30-ish, if they have 10 classmates, you can say, okay, let's do a little short timed writing You've got five minutes. I want you to like tell me that information about yourself. Now tell me about five other classmates. You've got six minutes. Go. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they need to have that sheet. And they're like, okay, they're looking. They need to understand, therefore, what they've asked, what the person has said. And then you can highlight stuff like third person, right? And just Mm -hmm. go, oh, don't say you're from, remember, you're not from Pittsburgh. 
she's from Pittsburgh. Here's she is. And they're mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, got it. Thanks. So in order to do the task, they sort of have to pay attention to that extra information. Mm -hmm. And what's fun is by the end of the unit, look at all the information you have about each other. They could do a long writing. They could compare, teach them but, teach them and, teach them also. Now they can say, I'm from Atlanta Mm -hmm. and Johnny is from Atlanta too. And so they can level up with some stuff words, as Amy Leonard calls them. Um, They can... Just, you know what, stay right there, just medium bar. Like for my kids who are really nervous and really like sort of hesitant in a language class, if I tell them, these are also your can-do statements. Can you tell me where you're from? Can you tell me how old you are? Can you tell me where you live? Well, then if you can do these, then you just did it. And then usually if there's a speaking component in that unit, those will be the same questions. So students see that it's really intentional and it's all really planned out. And once you do that for like several units, Now, by the end of the level, we have six units. So I know if I have five questions a unit, now at the end of level one, I can pull any of at least 30 questions Mm -hmm. to ask you. And I know that you should be able to answer them and in in a complete way. And that's one that I use in both levels. And it's really, really fun. Okay, so now I have my logistics questions so that yes. I can start doing that next week. Right. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so the first one is, so each student, each individual student is getting a roster, their Correct. own personal Correct. roster. Yep. So you said there were columns yes. for each question. So is there space where they are then writing in the information that Correct. they're learning? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So it's not just checking off that they ask these. So Correct. there's a place to record the information. Exactly. And they have an, about enough space for like a few words, depending on how big their handwriting is. And you can obviously, you know, you can always adjust the boxes and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so the first question is also always like, what is your name? So mm-hmm. it's always kind of like one mm-hmm. more question. And so it's, you know, it's intentional, but also gives them a little chance to level up to your kids who are like, Ooh, how do you say, you know, they're always gonna, mm-hmm. they're always mm-hmm. gonna do that. And so you can give them a little extra the ones who are just sort of like, nope, I'm good with this. I'm fine with this are mm-hmm. good because the expectation is clear. Mm-hmm. And then the ones who struggle a little bit are also, you know, they, the bar is visible to them. They're not mm-hmm. going like, gosh, how do I know how I'm doing? Mm-hmm. Listen, I just need you to be able to hear these five questions and be able to answer them and like, mm-hmm. let's talk about them or I can prompt you or whatever. So with those five guiding questions that come up with mm-hmm. the unit, yep. I'm assuming that the sort of maybe the first question, I'm thinking in a linear way here. Mm-hmm. So the fourth or fifth question maybe will be in six or seven days from now where you're going to exactly. touch upon that. Exactly. So as they are initially starting with this, because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking you're doing it in the first Tuesday of exactly. the unit. Yes. So they're only maybe asking just the first question. So exactly. as they, as you move on through the unit mm-hmm. and once you've gotten to the second week of it, then when students are going around, they're actually asking maybe three or four of those questions. Exactly. So those first students, they're not necessarily going to have answers to three, four, and five. Correct. But okay. So I'm just, I'm just making sure totally. that I'm logistically understanding yes. it. Absolutely. And for me, it's sort of a, um, it's that, and then it's sort of a gradual release. Like now that we're here in unit six of six in level one, because we do a level per semester. Now I can sort of feel like here's all six or here's all five questions. And with a, you know, still with a lot of scaffolding, they're like, okay, I know how this works. It's like a preview of the unit almost. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of mileage out of that. And what's really nice is if you, you know, end early and you're like, oh no, because, you know, I mean, as a classroom teacher, six minutes might as well be six hours. You know, you look at the clock and you're like, oh no, <laughs> I know. It's like, like they can smell fear where they're like, is that it? Is that all we're doing? And you're like, no, no, yeah. no there's always more. It's always, it's a great backup activity. If you're like, you know what, let's, add, let's quick add three more people mm-hmm. because they already have the sheet. You've already made the copies. They have it on hand. So it's really great for like a substitute assignment. It's a great mm-hmm. backup. Um, it's a great like fill in, you know, kind of catch up or, um, you know, any kind of those things where teaching gets unpredictable, which is like all the time, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just great to see them not be fearful of being asked a question yeah. after a couple of units of it. You know, they're mm-hmm. not like, oh, what do we talk about? Yeah. And the more you can make the questions relevant, like we were talking about, or, you know, deep, I mean, they don't have to be that deep, but like how the more you can make the questions matter, the more you can do with it. So Mm -hmm. like now maybe the unit writing is tell me about, you know, tell me about yourself for unit one and tell me about three other people Mm -hmm. because you've means you've asked and answered every question 
over 30 times. Mm-hmm. You know, you've if you've got if you've talked to 30 people and you've asked and answered 50 or five questions, you've you've asked over 150 mm-hmm. questions. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking of my huge classes. Right. So at some point, it's also a conversation at the end of the unit if they're not able to do that. Mm-hmm. Like literally just where are you from? I'm from here. Mm-hmm. How old are you? I'm this old. So like I said, it, it also kind of illuminates things for kids in ways that I think as language teachers, I know I tend to be like, well, you know, just some basic questions about you. And kids are like, mm-hmm. such as, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, right. it's a speaking test, lady. Tell me what you're going to ask <laughs> yeah. me. You know, so there's some transparency involved as well. Okay. All right. The roster. All right. Um, that's oh, it's my, my favorite. For I've got a template too. Uh, I can send oh. you a template. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, we have our roster going. So what else is in your bag of interpersonal tricks? I keep a lot of games in my bag of interpersonal tricks. So like Jenga is really, if you can code the blocks, like the sides of blocks. So if you just get that old school Jenga game and on the side, again, I like to do like five or six different kinds. So if you've got a marker, you can literally just put the number, numbers one through six, let's say. Amazon also sells some multicolored Jenga sets, which are really cool. And they run about $12. So if you've got some department money and you can buy like five, you know, that's a really good investment. I've had mine for years and then kind of trade them, you know, among people. But with the color coding or with the number coding on the side of the blocks, what you can do then is project questions that have to do with those codes. And that's, again, sort of feels forced interpersonal, but not really. So you can make it sort of see, you can make it presentational or interpersonal. And I like it as an interpersonal. So like the way Jenga works, right? You touch the block, you've decided on that one. So if they touch it and it's blue, then I have to ask somebody the blue question in my group. Or if it says three on the side of the block, I have to ask them question number three. And I, as a student, am looking up at the front board going, um, okay, question three says, uh, where are you from? I'm thinking of like novice unit mm-hmm. one, right? Or um, maybe it's an AP class, you know, like where, you know, what's technology you use every day? How much time do you spend on your phone and why? So they can then record those answers and not only ask those questions, but get information from those, get to know each other better, get Mm -hmm. to practice some of those structures Mm -hmm. and also just play Jenga, which is fun. And it kind (laughs) of tricks them into learning, right? Who doesn't (laughs) love to, you know, inevitably somebody knocks it over super early in the game and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you know, Mm -hmm. but. It's just a fun game. Things like that, card games, are really fun to do that where you can code the cards and you do the same thing. So maybe they think they're playing like Go Fish or they think they're playing like Four of a Kind or Spoons, but really it's a way to get them speaking and you're kind of circulating going, don't forget about the French, don't forget about the Spanish, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and a lot of times like it's so accessible that they don't. Like my Mm -hmm. students don't just sit and play Jenga, you know, they're like, oh, that's right. We have to ask and answer. Um, what's your favorite color? Okay. And you know, and they do in the target language, mm-hmm. obviously. And it's almost like, oh yeah, that's right. The Spanish, like that's the mm-hmm. easy part. Yeah. And so things like that, that are games, a lot of times my secret's always like games, they probably already know how to play mm-hmm. so that you're not explaining the rules a thousand right. times and things that I can get a lot of mileage out of. Mm-hmm. So I know if I've got that interpersonal roster and we're going to do that again, let's say six times a unit. I know we're going to play Jenga probably maybe twice a unit. Then maybe I have a card game or something else where it's it's something like a manipulative that I can recycle every unit for interpersonal questions or, you know, like draw and ask or that kind of thing. Like they draw a card and ask somebody and record that information. If I can use that once, well, that was like six, seven, eight, nine. Right there, That were those were nine activities that I can incorporate into a unit that I know is going to be 15 days long minus like the last day for the unit summative. Mm -hmm. So for me as a teacher, I immediately feel relief Mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, they're going to be speaking. They're going to be speaking in ways that I don't have to make a million new activities all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, at the very least, even if they go, Oh, this again, you know, which they're going to, they're teenagers. Mm-hmm. You can hand them a million dollars and they go, Oh, oh this a again. million dollars. <laughs> this again. She's always giving us money. You know, like they're going to just like roll their eyes at whatever. But by the end of the unit, like they can't say those things that really drain us as teachers, which is like, what? I'm not ready. What? Speaking. They're just like, Oh, this again. Mm-hmm. And you're like, yes. indeed, you're this again. And mm-hmm. so it's, Again, like if there's some transparency involved, I think with speaking, I know this is going to be, this will be unpopular with some, maybe it's a hot take, but 
I think we have to be more transparent about speaking and about interpersonal than we do with the other modes because Mm -hmm. it's the one they get the most self-conscious about. Mm -hmm. And it's the one that parents and students alike both think they see the most results from, Mm -hmm. even though we know that, you know, Mm-hmm. all of the modes yeah. come together and are, and are very important. Mm-hmm. But can, can you yeah. clarify what you meant when you just said we have to be more transparent about that? Yeah. Does that mean more scaffolding? What do you mm. mean when you say being more transparent about that? I think that and, and I, when I think of transparency, I think like why we're doing it. You know, it's mm-hmm. not just like they don't just go home and say, oh, yeah, we did some like speaking practice today in Spanish. It's like, OK, yeah, but what did you do it for? Like mm-hmm. transparent in the purpose. Mm-hmm. And I think like like you just said, transparent, definitely in the structure, like what did we give them to help them? How did we sort of gradually release it? Like those roster questions. How mm-hmm. are we, you know, h- how are we structuring that? Like how are we thinking with them in mind and with the rest of our lessons and our end goals in mm-hmm. mind, you know, with reading and writing, it's with a little more leeway um, and listening to, cause you might say, Oh, he's going to say an extra word. Calcetines. You haven't seen that yet, but I'll mm-hmm. write it up here. But with speaking, you know, it's like, it's performance. It's su- it, they're self-conscious. You're super vulnerable. There's a lot of vulnerability mm-hmm. in speaking a new language if it's a new language for them. So really being, I think, as explicit as possible. And when I think of stakeholder transparency, like that's what parents say, right? Like, oh my gosh, you you know, it's like a great story when a parent emails you, he won't stop speaking French at home. And you're like, oh, like we've made it. Uh But it takes a lot of work to get to that point. And it's a lot of, it's just a lot of work and a lot of intention and really a lot of thought behind not just like, okay, let's do partner A, partner B. There may be a time and a Mm -hmm. place for that, but let's also like come back to that and then Mm -hmm. do it again and do it again and do it in a new way. Yeah. I appreciate your, your lens with using the games is that they're not for just the specific purpose of this is the game we use, or this is the interpersonal activity. You know, if we, we can teach your language, we call it Uh an interpersonal activity, but the kids call it a game, right? (laughs) Uh, um, You know, we just have to be careful. Uh, It's not all fun and games. It's interpersonal activities. It's interpersonal. Uh, it's work. <laughs> they can be used for any topic. It's not, this is just the game that's used when we do the topic on shopping and clothing or something like that, or whatever exactly. the unit happens to be. So like when you were talking about having the numbers and the questions, you can swap those out easily for any topic. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and, uh, and then the students, they, they get used to it. And, you know, I, I was just thinking today, it was a random little thought as you were talking where the, the kids, they they get used to it and you think, oh, oh, this again, this again. And a science teacher walked up to me and she said, I asked her, oh, what did you do in class today? And she said, oh, we were just playing um, saute before we came um, up to, we were having advisory meetings. And I said, like, saute, like I play in my, it's jump. Like saute, like we play in my, my French class. And she said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We play it with the science terms. <laughs> And oh, I thought, amazing. Oh my gosh. So you took a game from my class that I think that sometimes they're like, oh, this again. And you're playing it with science terms down in the science yep. labs. Yep. <laughs> amazing. Like, okay. All right. But again, of course, to us, they'd be like, oh, a million dollars again. But then right. little, little do you know. A million dollars. Stop giving me so much money. <laughs> right. Little do you know. That's so right, true. Right. Right. So as I said at the beginning, Everybody, everybody, I mean, all the cool kids are pulling their inspiration from Meredith White. So, like, how, like, let's talk about, like, like this whole world of, of, of paying it forward. Where are you getting your inspiration from? Oh, that's hard, too. Well, I think the people, the people that you've had on, I mean, I, it's like, if I had a list of like the people I most admire, it's like, oh, they've been on Joshua's podcast. Like, so we're all just equally fans of each other. I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's people who are, like you said, helping out teachers, like we said before of like things, you know, resources, stuff, like what are we using tomorrow? What can I put in my various buckets? If it's next unit, if it's next year, if it's in my, man, I love that for you, but no thanks. You know, mm-hmm. wherever wherever it fits into our little various containers. I mean, it's like a Ben Tinsley. He was just on a couple of times and I could mm-hmm. just, he's so incredible. And Florencia and Maris and just people who are vulnerable and share so many resources, like Kia London, Alicia Quintero, um, mm-hmm. just all these incredible people who we get to 
work with even from afar, Mm -hmm. you know, which is so cool that like the internet has brought us together. Mm -hmm. You know, we grew up, I was raised, my parents are total baby boomers and, you know, I grew up and everything was like, not the internet, you know, like Mm -hmm. don't go meeting strangers on the internet. And now (laughs) all we're doing is collaborating with strangers on the internet. It's like cars, don't get in cars with strangers. We literally call Uber, we send them money, we tell them our address and we're like, now come get me. Like it's the, it's the opposite of what we were raised with. My parents would be horrified, but we are so lucky to have so many people that you can just, I mean, on your phone go, Hey, what do you think about this? And you can pick the brains of Bill Van Patten and Mm -hmm. just all these incredible teachers who go, yeah, I think, I don't know if I would do that. Have you, have you thought about this? And there's like, poof, a magical idea from somebody Mm -hmm. who's you know, in the trenches with you. And I think that's, what's really important. So we just, we're so lucky. I, I consider myself so incredibly lucky to be in a particular profession of language teachers who are just so generous. Yes. There's this, this generosity. And I say this all the time. I don't know if math teachers are doing this on like math chat or whatever. Doubt it. Maybe, (laughs) maybe it's happening, you know, but just the, the amount of information ideas and collaboration that happens with language teachers is just it's overwhelming it's to the point where i just can't do it all you know Mm. Uh, but it is wonderful how generous teacher language teachers are absolutely well and and the stuff you know it's one thing to say hey here's a great idea it's another to say hey here's here's a great idea but here's the document i used what i don't recommend is blah 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 Mm-hmm. Because that's that's a whole different ball game when you're a new teacher, when you're at a new school, when you're trying to step up and level up those units and you go, gosh, I hate this clothing unit, but I just, I am stumped. I am at a creative paralysis. I am just, I cannot think of any more games. I mean, suddenly there pops in like Martina Bex and she's like, oh, mm-hmm. did you want no prep activities? Mm-hmm. Poof, you know, a blog mm-hmm. post with links and John Bracey and Keith Toda and all these people who are like, oh yeah, yeah I blogged about that. Mm-hmm. Here, take my whole Google folder. And you're like, what? Yes. It's stuff that you can print out and use tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That generosity. Amazing. 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 Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you ready to play my little game of this or that so we can pull the teacher okay. curtain back? Get to know <laughs> the real Meredith. Brace okay. yourself. Okay. So just choose one of these. If you want to say why, we can learn maybe a little. It's amazing the stuff that we <laughs> learn in this section. You know, oh, you're an opera singer. Oh, you play yeah. flute. You know, that's right. Okay. So the first question, mm-hmm. are you a glass half full or glass half empty kind of person? Ooh, I am probably probably full, but I'm really just happy to have a glass, honestly. <laughs> so like a little bit of both. I'm just glad like, yay, thanks for, you know, just glad to be here. Like, like I'm just glad I have a glass. And if you want to fill it, that's super. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I think full. I think full. Uh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Half full. Okay. Are you... Are you going to choose the camping option or the hotel? Ooh, depends. Probably Mm -hmm. depends on the location, but yeah, depends on the location. Either one. So are you, you're into the camping scene a little bit? Yeah, we do. We do. Well, we're in, um, we're in Metro Atlanta. So if you go about an hour North, we've got some really beautiful camping areas and we're right at the foothills of the mountains. So yeah, it's a lot of options. Okay. All right. And the last one. Are you going to win the spelling bee or the geography bee? Oh, spelling bee all day. (laughs) Absolutely. And can I get that in a sentence? (laughs) For sure. I was one word away in sixth grade from going to the national spelling bee. Wow. The word was pinnacle. I'll never live it down. Oh. You'll never let it down. Never let it down. Uh, okay. And I was I was about to ask you if being on this podcast was the pinnacle of your career. Clearly. But- <laughs> P-I-N-N-A-C-L-E. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. Anytime. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there are teachers listening that would like the opportunity to hang out with you a little bit, pick your brain on some stuff. So how can teachers be reaching out and connecting with you? Absolutely. Well, I'm super easy to find. My handles across all platforms are the same. Um, I am at PRHS Spanish. So if it exists, I probably have something there for teaching and you can find me there. PRHS Spanish. And all of that will be in the show notes for sure. And some 
advice. I'd like to have some advice for teachers. And before you give your advice about interpersonal activities, I'm just I'm picking out some themes that you had mentioned as we were talking. And when you first started, you said, when's the game? Mm -hmm. And that's one of those Again, like the the Maris Hawkins and Florencia Henshaw, simple questions about communication. Mm -hmm. If you just think, but but when's the game? You know, you've learned all the vocabulary. You can conjugate the verb, but Mm -hmm. when are you going to use it? And that was my huge, like uh, just having those little things that when you're planning something, it's like, uh, okay, but but when's the game? But when's Mm -hmm. the game? So that that was. A, a nugget of advice that you started with right at the beginning that has stayed with me. Wow. So what advice could, additional advice, I guess, uh, could you leave with teachers when they're looking for those interpersonal experiences for their students? My advice is to think on, you have to kind of take your teacher hat off for a second and think about the conversations and the way you go about conversations in everyday life. So like, have you had that conversation in the target language, you know, with somebody either in your travel experience or in your study abroad experience, or if you've had not had either, right, which can make us feel really self-conscious as language teachers and vulnerable, what kind of conversations are you having day to day? Like what's the information being shared? Um, and that really simplifies things for me. So it's sort of, it's not really adding to your to-do list, it's really adding to your to-don't list, you know, when it comes to, because it really pairs down and it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, this, this, and this might be a given. What's the deeper conversation? And and for me, it comes down to, I have to think for myself when I'm creating interpersonal tasks or questions for my students, what's actually interesting? You know, what's going to actually make them go, oh, okay, I hadn't thought about that, you know, mm-hmm. or instead of just the thing going kind of below the surface a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I like a lot of question words for that, not just X and Y, but Y, X Mm -hmm. and Y, you know, Mm -hmm. what do you, what's your, in your opinion Mm -hmm. does blah, blah, blah. And we can do a lot of really simple structures. So that's, that's, I think my advice is to really have a, might be a difficult, but really reflect and have a hard look at what it is we're actually communicating about because the things we argue about tend to be things that really don't matter. Like as teachers, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like teach the numbers, teach the colors. Okay. But what information are you ever exchanging with numbers and colors? Mm -hmm. Your phone number, right. Uh, Might be the color of the house or a car because you're giving someone directions. Like what are the actual tasks that we're completing as users of the language and as adults Mm -hmm. out and about in the world And as multi or bilingual people, I think that gives us a little more insight into what they should actually be doing Mm -hmm. or could actually be doing. And it pairs down a little bit. But, you know, John Bracey, too. Don't get fired. (laughs) Don't get fired. Do what you got to (laughs) do. Yes. I remember when I had him on the podcast, like last year sometime, and I asked him his advice at the end. And Mm -hmm. it was about communicative language teaching. That's what we were talking (laughs) about. I think we were talking about uh, comprehensible input. And... It was, what do you suggest to teachers? He said, number one, don't get fired. That's right. That's it. (laughs) And then try all this stuff, but just make sure you don't get fired. Because if you you get fired, then you have no way of helping these students. You know, so always coming back to that. Amen. Don't get fired, whatever you got to do. Well, Meredith, I have just so enjoyed just talking shop with you. You know, about what happens in our classrooms. It was a total blast. So thank you so very much for being here. And I'll see you the next time I'm in Atlanta. That's right. Absolutely. Which I, it's soon, right? We need to coordinate that. uh, March. Amazing. I'll be here. (laughs) I'm easy to find. (laughs) All righty. Thank you so much. Thank you. What are your takeaways from that conversation with Meredith White? Hopefully you're going into your classroom tomorrow with lots of ideas for interpersonal activities. Be sure to check out the show notes to connect with Meredith White. You'll also see the link to sign up for Talking Points, my weekly email newsletter with tips and resources for language teaching. There are also links to get in touch with me if you'd like to work together, either in person in your school or remotely. I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. You've been listening to the World Language Classroom Podcast. Be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening so you don't miss a single episode. Let's continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at 
WL Classroom. You can also see over 250 blog posts about language teaching at, you guessed it, wlclassroom.com.